Okay, 1 Kings chapter 15, the sons of Rehoboam and Jeroboam are now ruling the Israel and Judah, and we're going to see what they do. Now, verse 1, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. So Rehoboam died first, basically. So Rehoboam died, and then his son Abijam became the ruler over Judah. So now we have Abijam and Jeroboam. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. So Abijam is in the is dealing with idolatry. He's he is doing what his father did, which is heavy taxes on the people, uh, living in wealth, but living on the backs of his people and causing lots of idolatry and hating Jeroboam and Israel and, and continuing that civil war. Verse 4, Nevertheless, for David's sake did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him to establish Jerusalem. So give him a lamp or a light, basically, uh, an opportunity to be guided, uh, basically. So this is supposedly going to help them, but Unfortunately, I don't think they're going to follow that. Um, verse 5, Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So David was a, actually a pretty good king. He was quite obedient, uh, except for what he has dealings with Uriah the Hittite, which means sleeping with his wife and then having him killed. So that was the main mess up that David did, that he's punished for. But outside of that, David usually did pretty good. Even after that, while David still struggled, he still tried to do better, basically. Verse 6, And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. So he grew up again in, this, in the, the civil war. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. So remember, that is the... Uh, those books that they use as reference to help us understand First Kings, but it's not the books of Chronicles that we have. Those are different. This is there's more writings we still have not we don't have access to that give us more information about this period of history. Uh, verse eight: And Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his stead. And in the twentieth year of Jeroboam king of Israel reigned Asa over Judah. So Rehoboam ruled. Jeroboam ruled, Rehoboam dies, his son Abijam comes in, rules a short time, and then dies, and his son Asa comes in. Now this is Jeroboam's, it tells us, last chapter, Jeroboam ruled 20 year, 22 years, and in the 20th year of Jeroboam, Asa is there. So this is the third king of Judah that Jeroboam has had, but now Jeroboam's about to die, and then his son Nadab's going to come in, basically. So, verse 10, And forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalom. So he, came, he comes in, and he's same, he's not necessarily, excuse me, Asa is not the, it says his son Asa, Abijam, slept with his fathers, they buried him to David, Asa his son reigned in his stead. But they have the same mom, basically. So this could be, Abijam becoming the king, taking the king's harem, having his own children, basically. Uh, so technically, if you look at this, Asa and Abijam are brothers more than father-son, but they technically are father-son, uh, you know, kind of weird, weird things, but that's what they did back then. It's kind of strange. Maybe that's why. They're all, they're all a bunch of rednecks. Um, sorry. <laughs> that was just a little side commentary. Okay, so now, uh, let's see, verse 11, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. A Joseph Smith's translation, as he commanded David his father. So he follows the commandments given to David that his brother, or his older, his father didn't follow. So Asa actually is finally doing better, basically. He's trying to follow the commandments, trying to do what King David was told to do, those kinds of things, restore those things. Basically, verse 12, he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. And also Makkah, his mother, even her, he removed from being queen. 
because she had made an idol in a grove, and Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect in the, with the Lord all his days. And he brought in the things which his father had dedicated for the things which himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver, gold, and vessels. So he brought the precious stuff back to the temple, back to the house of the Lord, and tried to restore the real religion, basically, what's, what's happened here. He didn't get rid of the other high places, because those are probably outside of Jerusalem in Jeroboam's jurisdiction. Uh, verse 19, there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. So now we jump to Basha, basically, as king of Israel, uh, even though so we're, there's, there's, they're kind of jumping a little bit, because we heard about the death of Jeroboam and Rehoboam last chapter. But now this chapter we hear that Jeroboam lived a little longer than Rehoboam, and then Rehoboam went through a few kings, and now Jeroboam's dead, and uh, Nadab was there, and then his son, uh, Basha, king of Israel, came up. So now they're, both, of them, both of them have gone down three tiers, basically. Uh, and verse 17, And Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might not suffer any to go out or to come into Asa, king of Judah. So again, Basha is going, hey, if, if, Asa, if Asa is restoring the true religion and Israel decides to go back, that's bad for my power, so I have to reestablish this ancient the idolatry, basically, of this fake religion that Jeroboam put in place, uh, which is basically the religion, religious philosophies of what was there before Israel showed up. Uh, verse 18, Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee, and between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent unto thee a present of silver and gold. Come and break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So he's saying, look, we once had an alliance. Our fathers had an alliance. And I know you're, you're kind of siding with the king of Israel. I want you to break that promise with him and build an alliance with us, basically. And I'm going to pay you with a whole bunch of gold and silver, basically. Verse 20, So Ben-Hadad hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of the host which he had against the cities of Israel. And smote Ejon and Dan and Abel Beth Machah and all Sinaroth with all the land of Naphtali. So this is kind of the northern area of Israel is being destroyed by Syria because Judah has made an alliance with them. Verse 21, And it came to pass when Basha heard thereof that he left off building of Ramah and dwelt in Tirzah. So he stopped the construction he was doing in Ramah and he got out of there basically. Verse 22, then King Asa made a proclamation throughout all Judah. None was exempted, and they took away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherein Basha had builded. And King Asa built with them Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. So he took this construction project that has been abandoned by Basha and basically said, all the people go out, gather up all the construction material. We're going to go use it to rebuild some of our own areas, the little suburb areas around Jerusalem. Verse 23, the rest of all the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did and the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Nevertheless, in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. So what could that mean, diseased in his feet? We don't know and they don't really give us a footnote to kind of talk about that. Um, most likely he was suffering from like gout would be a common thing. Gout is a problem where you have a lot of uric acid building up in your body and it settles because of gravity, settles down in your feet, and it feels like you're walking on pins and needles all the time. Uh, a lot of this comes because of a lot of, uh, basically, you eat too much red meat and you end up with all, you know, a lot of sodas in today's world can increase that uh, because a lot of the you know, carbons and sulfurs and things in the drinks. Uh, but a lot of red meat as well, so he probably was really well fed as the king, uh, but he ends up with gout, basically, which is a more of a kind of an uh, autoimmune type disease. So gut problems, other issues in his life, possibly some diabetes and other things, he ends up with a disease in his feet. 
Now, the other problem that could happen is, is more of a true type 2 diabetes because nephropathy. Nephropathy is where the nerve endings, basically in your, in your extremities, your hands and your feet, they, go, they get ruined because you have so much excess sugar and insulin in your body from diabetes that it destroys those nerve endings and they don't work as much. And then you can't feel your feet. You get pains and sores and other problems. And so that could be a problem as well. It could be he got injured maybe, he got infections in his feet, a cellulitis type problem could be there as well. Um, there's a lot of other things that could be there potentially. Most likely it was because he was living a lifestyle that allowed him lots and lots of rich foods, but wasn't exercising, wasn't eating a real healthy diet basically, and it caused uh, autoimmune disease and other problems like that. Most likely that's what it is. We don't know for sure, but that's, that's very likely. Verse 24, and Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead. So we're learning about lots of these little, we're, we're learning a little bit about a bunch of kings. There's a lot more information, but they're in books that have been lost in history, unfortunately. So verse 25, and Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And reigned over Israel two years. So this is this matches up. Remember, Asa comes in in the 20th year of Jeroboam. Jeroboam only ruled 22 years. So Asa had been in rule two years. Jeroboam died. Nadab comes in, basically. So this is the third tier king descendants. So Rehoboam, uh, uh, just forgot, Abijam, and then Asa. And now we have Jeroboam and Nadab, basically. But then we learn about Bashan. So Bashan maybe was ahead of Nadab, but we're not quite sure how that worked out. Um, we're, we're still, there's, it's a little confusing because they kind of jump around chronologically, but uh, just there's, that's what's happening. So we're talking about Jeroboam. He went two years with Asa in, and then Jeroboam dies, and now Nadab's in, basically. Verse 26, and he, Nadab, did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in his sin wherein he made Israel to sin. And Basha, the son of Ahijah, the house of Issachar, conspired against him. And Basha smote him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, for Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. Even in the third year of King Asa of Judah did Basha slay him and reigned in his stead. So now we get the clarification. So Jeroboam, so we have Rehoboam and Jeroboam, then we have Abijam and Asa, then Nadab, and then Nadab reigns about two, he's, he reigns just a short period of time, and then he gets killed in a siege, and Basha takes over basically. So that's where the story of Asa, Asa and Basha come in that we just read. So now we're kind of getting the backstory of how it ties in. So this is part of the challenge of the Old Testament is that it kind of jumps chronologically around a little bit. It's trying to tell a story to teach us lessons. And so it doesn't follow chronologically all the, all the time. So you have to think about it to make sure you get that connected. So verse 28, Even in the third year of Asa king of Judah did Basha slay him and reigned in his stead. And it came to pass when he reigned that he smote all the house of Jeroboam. He left not to Jeroboam any that breathed until he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. So this is really interesting here. So Basha is not of Jeroboam's line. Basically, Nadab and Basha aren't related. So Basha comes in, though, and wipes out all of Jeroboam's family, takes the whole thing out, which is the prophecy given, basically. Uh, so, verse 31, now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? That's the book we don't have. And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Basha, the son of Ahijah, to reign over all Israel in Terza, twenty and four years. So, Asa had been in power in Judah for two years when Jeroboam died and Nadab came in. But in the third year of Asa was when Basha took over. So Nadab ruled one year or less than a year, basically. So Nadab wasn't around for very much before that changed hands to Basha, basically. So that's really interesting, just for us to note that. And then he lasted 24 years. 
Verse 34, uh, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of Jeroboam and, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. So while ba Basha got rid of Jeroboam's family, he basically still continued to rule and reign like Jeroboam did, which is idolatry, holding on to his power. Remember, Asa was trying to restore the true religion, trying to bring people back and get rid of idolatry and the fertility worship and other things like that. And uh, Basha is like, nope, we're going to solidify, we're going to double down on our false religion to main, so I can maintain power, basically, against him. That's what we've learned a lot in this chapter. So those are the struggles and challenges that's happening here. A good example for us to, again, think about what would have been like to be alive at this time, to have a true religion and a false religion simultaneously happening. How do we know how to find truth? We seek the guidance of the Spirit. This is super important. The whole point of the gospel of Jesus Christ is for us to individually have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what saves us. That is what helps us in the next life. And so the whole point of organized religion is to have a organized way to teach us and help us understand the gospel and help us to encourage us to go have that personal relationship with Christ. We should be seeking truth by seeking relationship with Christ. The scriptures tell us the closer we come to Christ, the more we gain the spirit of revelation. So the, the more we build our relationship with Christ, the more the spirit can work with us and reveal things to us and help us with things. So that's the important factor. That is what all of this is all about. And we're seeing examples of what happens when leaders go away from following God, when they do more of what they want to do and less of what God wants to do, and then when they come back, Asa tries to restore it, and now we have that problem again of who's the true religion, who's the true power, and that civil war struggle between them. And again, that's not the, that's the, the false dichotomy. The real, the real thing you should be focusing on is what is truth? Where does the truth exist? And let's follow that. That's the important part. So Making sure you have your proper perspective and priorities is very, very important in understanding the gospel appropriately. Let's jump into chapter 16 to continue this story on.